And we are live on the air. Hello, friends. Welcome to another Code Mentor Office Hours. Uh, my name is Mark um, from Code Mentor. And uh, if this is your first time joining us, which I, I think I saw on the RCP list, we have a, quite a few new names, which is exciting to see. Um, basically, what we do is we get together and, uh, and chat with some great technologists that we're fans of and are working on you know, projects and, and frameworks that we're trying to learn more about and, and our community is trying to learn more about. And we're in the middle of a, a big JavaScript framework series that we've been covering all different aspects of JavaScript and we're going to be continuing to do so uh, actually all the way through May. Um, and today we are, uh, we are going deep, deep into that as well. Um, so in terms of format, if this is your first session, um, feel free to jump in with questions via group chat if you're in the live room with us. If you're watching the live broadcast on Google+, Plus, there's a Q&A app that if you throw questions in, I'll get notifications for, and we'll hit all those at the end. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's guest, uh, Matthew Beal. Uh, Matthew is a member of the Ember.js core team. Uh, author of an early book on Ember and writes at madhatted.com. Uh, through a consulting partnership named 201 Created, he's worked with nearly two dozen companies to solve tough problems with Ember. Um, Matthew's joining us today from Montreal uh, and we'll be getting an introduction to Ember.js and learn how to use it to build the basic web application. So uh, Matthew, take it away. Yeah, howdy folks. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure what our uh, what, what the background that people have of Ember is. So I think we're going to jump through this in kind of three parts today. I'm going to start off and go through just really uh, just a handful of minutes of some slides and talk a little bit about what Ember uh, purports to do and kind of like what the you know the general the general pitch around it is and a couple of the high level ideas. Uh, and then we're going to flop into trying to do some live coding. Uh, I have a slightly ambitious goal of being able to put together an entire Hangman game. Uh, we'll see how quickly that goes. I did some prep, so it shouldn't be completely blind. And um, at any point during that, you guys should, I think, feel free to uh, ping in with questions or comments, and uh, we'll hopefully move through that and then have time for some questions in the end here. Uh, or I definitely expect we will have time for some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off a screen share here so you guys can see some of these slides. Cool. Okay. So, uh, like I mentioned, I'm not quite sure how familiar you guys are uh, with Ember.js. Uh, Ember.js is a uh, MVC framework. It's a, a JavaScript framework for building applications in the browser. And uh, I guess to kick off, my name is Matthew Mixonic. Uh, I run a small consulting shop called 201 Created and um, uh, you work on the Ember.js core team. So the big pitch behind Ember is really that we want you to be more productive. Uh, it's not that we are better than something else or that we are faster than something else or, or anything that we think is kind of so trite. Instead, we really try and focus on being a tool that helps you be a more effective developer and get more things done. And I think uh, when I think about it, there are kind of these three points that feed into it. I want to, as a developer, make sure that I'm learning things that I'm going to be able to use for a long time. Uh, I, I don't want to pick up knowledge that's going to be specific to one framework too much. I know won't be useful to me in 10 years. I, I want to build on that stuff, and I want to build on the other tools in that stack. I want to avoid like regressions, and I don't want to be doing work over and over again. And testing is a really important part of that, and something that JavaScript has historically been really, uh, really kind of pathetic at, and that uh, Ember definitely helps us improve upon. And I want to reason about things within the domain of my problem. So when we're working on our Hangman game, I think you guys will get an idea of this, but the idea is that we don't want to be operating at the level of um, let me think about this array or let me think about these uh, uh, event observers or something like that. We want to be thinking about our problems in semantic ways. And if Ember can't help us think about our problems in a more semantic manner, then it's definitely falling short of our goals. A big important facet of Ember is that we're strongly uh, based on standards. We really believe that uh, the best way to ensure that people are learning things that are going to be useful in the future is to uh, encourage them to learn things that we know will become normal. And so this is a two-part process where not only are we following standards as they emerge, so as something like web components becomes a pattern, we try and adopt that, but it's something that's something that we try and help drive. So we're going to use a lot of ES2015 ECMAScript modules today, which are kind of a new API. Uh, Ember was definitely one of the frameworks that drove that discussion. Uh, we're not going to use a feature called decorators today, which is something about classes in JavaScript. 
Uh, but that's another API that Ember is definitely driving that's not even out yet. So this is like a two-way street, and uh, when you participate in the Ember community, you really do end up feeding back into this discussion about where the web is going as a platform, which is really pretty exciting. Uh, another quick thing here is that we try and uh, take testing really seriously. And uh, this is just an example that people are so uh, full of joy that they're tweeting. But Ember Try is a library that allows you to uh, test against multiple versions of Ember. So if you are a library author yourself and you want to know that you'll be compatible with the last two versions of Ember, which today would be 1.11 and 1.10, you can use this Ember Try library, which will help you test against each of those. So not only are we serious about things like unit testing, but kind of the ecosystem of testing and the culture of testing is definitely part of uh, what we do. And the very last one is trying to think about things at the, uh, at the level of my domain. And at, as kind of, as an example of this, um, Ember CLI, this great build tool that we have that we're definitely going to use today, Ember CLI has uh, a, a whole ecosystem around it of add-ons. And these add-ons allow me to just start working on a problem really quickly and then not think about how do I combine gulp and grunt or what do I choose for my build tool or my packaging? Do I choose Webpack or something else? I don't need to think about these questions. I can just operate at the high level of I want to build an app and I want to get moving. And uh, if you want to learn more about the add-ons, these are two great URLs to go and look at. Emberobserver.com grades add-ons to give them different um, point scales on a, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 means it's well-tested, well-documented, um, widely used. Emberaddons.com is more of a search engine for different add-ons that are out there. But the idea with Ember CLI is that I can just go ahead and kick off Ember new and say I want to create a new project called Fun Project, and then say if I want to use SAS in that project, I just Ember install Ember CLI SAS, and that's it. I don't need to configure anything. I don't need to edit any files. I just get going, and then I can get to work on my actual project. And then you actually get to being productive. So there's three things that Ember apps are, uh, that's kind of like the idea of the ecosystem. There are three things that Ember apps are built on top of um, the applications themselves in terms of architecture. And these come in different flavors, URLs, components, and services. Um, if some of you have learned a little bit of Ember before, then you're probably familiar with views and controllers. I'm kind of wrapping those up into components because components are really the pattern that we want to encourage you to use um, in the future. For services, uh, if you've used Ember before, you've probably used Ember Data, which we are not going to use today. But Ember Data is really just a good example of a, a, a well-done service. Um, it's kind of this thing that different components on your page can talk to and fetch information from, but it doesn't really live in any one spot that's on the page itself. And so as an example of this, uh, kind of a, a classic canonical thing to look at here is to look at GitHub. Uh, GitHub, we have a layout, and it has a couple different parts of the page. We can see that there's a URL called emberjs, emberjs, and then we render a bunch of components. So these components are like composable things, right? You could take these apart and imagine reusing them in different parts of your own application. You could have a header that goes across the whole site, a sidebar, which is only uh, there for, say, a GitHub repo, but would not be there for your settings page, for instance. And then you have this other section on the left, which is right now your list of files. If we change the URL, and we add a new leaf to the URL, then one of those components can change to reflect the new state. And this is how Ember wants you to reason about URLs. You really think of uh, URLs as driving the components that are on the page, and you think of your UI in terms of like a, a nested layout that the URL is driving. Uh, in the example that we go into today, we're actually not going to touch a lot of routing. We're going to touch a lot of services and components Services, like we said, don't really uh, uh, exist on the page. They're kind of in the ether. Uh, we like to think of them almost as being sideways. So if you think of your page as being a tree, services kind of live on the side of that tree, and things can talk to them or subscribe to them and interact with them in different ways. Uh, in this case, you could have the header, and you could have uh, a sidebar, which is shrunk on the side there. But uh, you could have a header and a sidebar, both of which subscribe to a certain service and work with it. And you could have the file list, say it has a special service for fetching, um, the most recent commits for all these files, it can have a specialized service that only it talks to. And there's nothing that stops you from just using that abstraction in a meaningful way. And that's pretty much it as far as our slides go. So I'm going to dive into actually building something with Ember CLI, and we're going to take a look at building out our Hangman application. Uh, any, any comments or anything? I'm not quite sure exactly how I can see any comments or questions, but any like comments or questions that I... Uh, 
at a high level before we um, dive into some next step stuff here? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and, and plow ahead. Uh, so let me see, did I lose my screen share when I did that? Sorry. Okay. Uh, Matthew, there's one question that just popped in. Um, mm -hmm. How do I install Ember and how different is it from Angular? So uh, much like Angular, uh, Ember itself is not a uh, not necessarily a thing that you need to install on your computer. You can just use Ember, Ember in an application. A really good example of this is if we go emberjs.jsbin.com, which is a, a, a popular site that we use for prototyping Ember applications. Uh, a popular site that we use for prototyping Ember applications and demonstrating bugs when we find bugs in the framework. Uh, if you submit a ticket to Ember and it's um, on GitHub, you'll often be asked, hey, can you recreate this in the JS bin? And if we just look at the HTML alone for a moment here, you can see that there's just some script tags. It requires jQuery. Um, here's the template compiler, which allows us to compile templates in the browser instead of on the server. And then Ember Debug, which is kind of the development build that has a couple um, not as performant but helpful error messages that you might want to work with. And now there are some templates. So here's an X handlebars template, which we flag with this type. And then this one has a name called index, and it has an each block. So this is pretty standard for an Ember application. If we look at the JavaScript for this, we just create the app. We give it some routes. So if we want to handle different URLs, we could put them here. And we have a route that we're going to define. We call this globals mode of Ember. And really, the only place where I would suggest you use this is when you're looking at a JS spin. But um, for some larger like enterprise applications, it's not uncommon that you would interact with an Ember application in this way with these kind of global variables. If we run this, we can see that just kicks off on the side here. Um, more often, what I'd expect is that you use something called Ember CLI. And this is what we're going to do a bit of work with today. Uh, and it's definitely the, the, the tool of choice and the tool of the future if you were to try and work with Ember on a project of any kind of scale. You can install it with NPM and Node.js. It's a Node.js application, um, although it really could be anything at all. Uh, we're not going to install it right now because it takes some time, uh, but I suggest you go ahead and pull it down locally and get started with it. Um, I already have it on my computer, so I'm just going to roll with that. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do here is I don't think I have a... Oh, do I have it? Right. So I'm not going to actually try to make an application right now, um, a brand new application using the Ember CLI tool, because it can be a little bit slow. Um, it uses NPM for package management in Node.js, <clears throat> and NPM is uh, like noted for being a bit of a, a performance um, snafu. But what I would normally do is say Ember new and say that we're going to call this, um, uh, what are we going to call this, solitaire? I was going to make a new solitaire application here. I just run Ember new, and it's going to kick off. You can see it creates a whole bunch of files that are going to go in, and now it's going to install dependencies. When it finishes installing dependencies, what we're going to end up with is something that looks just like our Hangman app. And if I look at like a tree of app, so this would be the app folder here. Actually, maybe this is even better in Vim. Yeah. So these are the files that it's going to install. And there's a couple that we're not going to worry about so much today. And one of those would be like the package JSON, which is the NPM dependencies. There's a Bower JSON, which is a different form of dependencies, which are more often used for client-side application development. Uh, there's a, a Brock file, which we might touch quickly, which is uh, related to the build pipeline itself. But most of the time that we work with these applications, we're working in the app directory. And in the app directory, we have a bunch of different folders for different types of things. So if I have a service, like we were talking about, there would be a service directory here. If I have components, they would be inside of my components directory. This is a, a very standard like layout for an Ember application. And we can see some things that are similar to what we saw in the JS bin. In this app.js, we have an Ember application extend. Back in the JS bin, we had an Ember application uh, create. So these are like the same kind of primitives. They're just being used in a slightly different manner. We have a router in the JS bin where we go ahead and map and we enter our routes. And if we look at Ember CLI, we also here have a router file um, where we can go ahead and add new routes to our application. Yeah, and this finally finished, and you can see that if you looked at the solitaire, you know, there's the directory. So it was, this is a brand new vanilla application with Ember, and if we go ahead and start up the server for it, sorry, I don't know what all those errors are over there in the console. 
Um, it, Ember comes with a variety of commands once you install the Ember CLI tool. So we can do Ember CLI H, and we have a whole list of different things that we can do here. Ember version, we'll just kick out our version number, for instance. If I run Ember serve, it's going to kick off a server, and that server by default is going to be on port 4200. I'm going to come over here and look at port 4200. If we look, I have a fresh Ember.js application with nothing else on the page. Uh, if I want to run tests for this application, I can go to slash tests. And so this brings us to a, a tool that is a great companion uh, to the command line Ember CLI tool, and that is the Ember Inspector, which is another thing. These are the two tools I, I really strongly suggest you try if you'd like to do a little bit of work with Ember on your own. You can see I have this Tomster over here that showed up, and that tells me that this page is, is running Ember.js. It's found out that this page is running Ember, and it's just going to give me a little note about that. If I open up my Inspector Tools, which is Command Option J, or you can find it up in one of these menus, I never click on it anymore. I guess down in View Developer, you can pull up in like Developer Tools with this link right here. Uh, if you pull this out, you'll see that there's a, another tab called Ember, and this is the Ember Inspector, uh, and it shows me that on this page I have like an application view. I can look at the routes and see that there's a couple of routes that Ember is going to make for me, and there's the application route, and then there's an index route. I have no deprecations. My app is up to date. I don't have any old style code that's no longer going to be supported. And there are a couple other things down here, like um, it'll help you measure render performance um, and show you all the things in your tree. So these are all the things that were rendered when Ember rendered the page. Um, so there's a variety of really good tools here. And uh, I guess I'll put together a list of links or something like that and be able to show those with you. But this is the Ember Inspector. You can find it for Firefox. You can find it for Chrome as well. It's not for both browsers. Uh, yeah, Jimmy has a question about should you use the pod structure. Uh, I'm going to dive into generating some things right now, and I'm actually not going to use the pod structure. Uh, actually, no, I will use the pod structure. I'll definitely use it for the components, so we'll see a little bit of pods. Um, there's two different ways that you can lay things out in Ember.js right now, and we're moving towards one in the future called pods, and we'll see the difference to that in a minute. So let me go ahead and dive into some of those changes. Okay. So the very first thing we're going to do here is we're going to we're going to create a hangman game, and I think I actually have it open over here. So I'm going to go back to this window. This is like the completed game here, and I can kick it off and say I want to guess a word, and we can see I have some blank letters. I have my blank hangman. I have a whole bunch of letters on the side here. So as I hit these up, oh, C is not in the word Bob. O oh, D is not in the word Bob. O oh, E is not in the word Bob. But if I hit B, it totally is, and you can see that this shows up here. And as soon as I hit O, oh, it'll say, like, great, you've actually solved this guy, and congrats. So really, really simple application that we're going to go ahead and try and, and put together here. So the very first thing we're going to do, because we're going to test drive this, is uh, to generate some codes. Let me actually move some windows around here. And in projects. I'm going to move my Ember server over to this other window. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is generate an acceptance test. So Ember has a generate command. If you do Ember dash G, uh, Ember G dash H, you can see here's a whole bunch of things that it'll allow us to create, such as views, uh, transforms, which are for Ember data, serializers, and a variety of other things that you'd use in a in a more complex application. Right now, though, we're just going to generate an acceptance test, and we're going to generate it one called. Um, it's going to be called. I guess it's just going to be called index. So come down into tests here. I'll see that I now have an acceptance folder, and I have this test. And Ember CLI took care of generating this test for us. And by default, I think it should, may actually pass. Yeah, it doesn't actually pass, um, but that's that's fine because we just generated it from scratch. It wasn't really intended to do anything. So we're going to change this to say that I'm visiting slash. That's all I want to care about. And we're going to change it. We're going to add something in here that says I want to know that the page says that uh, we're going to play Hangman. So I'm going to say I want to assert that it is OK, that I can find something on the page, that I can find a file that contains 
Do we want Sissy um, a hangman? So dot length here will return um, you know zero if we can't find it and one if we can't. So we can assume that that's going to be truthy. And then here we can say goes uh, play hangman. And if I go back. I should have in my templates folder by default an application handlebar. So we can see this is where we have welcome to Ember.js. If I use the Ember inspector to look at this, I can see the same thing. Here's my template application that it says. So I know that I'm looking uh, on the top left of my screen there, template application JS, when I'm looking at this guy who's on the screen. I can use this little inspector guy to find him too. So I'm going to go ahead and change this. And we're going to change this to play. Amen. And I'll go ahead and reload the page. Um, Ember CLI by default has an auto reload, so it'll just go ahead and reload with the new thing on the page. And if we go back and look at my tests, we can see that it passed. Here's my visiting slash test right here, and you can see that just ran just fine. So, great. So step one down. So we're going to um, write a, a second one. Uh, we're going to go ahead and generate. Let's, hmm. Yeah. So for the next thing, we're going to go ahead and look at. Um, uh, asserting that we have a list of letters. So in our original application here, we have this. Uh, we had a list going down the side. It's reloaded because it does auto reload. But we had a list of all the letters in our game. So to generate a list of letters in our game, I'm going to need a spot to put those letters. So first thing I'm going to do is make a controller. Um, when we look at this spot on the uh, in the rendered Ember application, we can see that there's a controller called application. But we didn't actually make this application controller. And Ember will often um, create these things for you if you haven't made them explicitly. So when I look at my controllers directory, I don't see one in there. I'm going to go ahead and add one. And at the top here, we're going to use a little bit of uh, ES6 module syntax. So I'm going to import Ember from a package called Ember. And this is just a stub that exists. And I'm going to export the default Ember controller.extend. And the export default is another ES6 JavaScript function. So Ember CLI comes with a tool called Babel. Babel allows us to write these kind of new syntax things, but these are standard syntax, even though they're new. It allows us to use this new syntax in pretty much uh, any application at anywhere. Uh, so here I need to create a list of all of the letters. So I'm going to just make a computed property called letters. And when I'm making this computer property, I'm going to uh, go ahead and return a list of the letters. So A, B, C, D, E, F. Great. And I'll go ahead and split it. Oops. So now it'll be split into an array. And then I want to show each of these letters, so I need to go back into my template. So here's my application template. And in my template, I'm going to get rid of this outlet because we're not going to use it. And go ahead and render this list of things. So Ember's syntax here is called um, handlebars. And Ember works kind of like with the handlebars project, although our own rendering layer is a little bit um, different than their rendering layer. So if I wanted to show each of these letters, I can iterate a list like so. And if I just throw a variable like letter there um, on line four, it'll go ahead and print out. And we can see there's our list of all of our letters. Um, this syntax right here that we're saying letter as letter, this is using a concept called block params. So block params are what this each helper is yielding. So it's going to yield for each item in the letters array this block of content over and over again. So if I say the letter is, uh, letter, then we'll see that it says over and over again, the letter is, the letter is, the letter is. Uh, there's a second optional uh, block param that you can use at this point if you want called index. And so if I go ahead and say index and show that as well, and maybe get rid of the letter is. Then we can see I list the index of each one of those numbers, or each one of those uh, uh, letters as I kick them out. So these block params are like the common part of what you'll see when you're working with um, arrays. And even when you're working with your own components, you can use these in Ember. Uh, so for each of these guys, though, 
Uh, we're going to want to do something a little bit uh, more crafty because we're going to have to handle clicks and do some interaction on these. So I'm going to go ahead and generate a new component that we can use for each of these um, guessable letters. And we're going to now generate this one as a pod. So I'm going to generate a component. And to use the pod syntax, I need to say pod. And we're going to see how this is different in a moment. And the pod I'm going to generate is a hangman. Uh, we're going to call these a hangman letter. Actually, before, we just call it a hangman letter. Cool. So if I go into components up here, I can see that I now have a, a hangman letter. And note the difference in between this is a, a pod-based item, whereas the application layout was not a pod-based item. So the application controller here is inside of the directory with its type. So the type is controllers, and the name of the thing was application. For templates, the type is a template, and the name of the thing is application. We generated this hangman letter using the dash dash pod prefix, which means it's going to uh, try and keep those two things, uh, those types, together inside of a directory with that name. So we find that this structure uh, kind of yields itself a lot better to working on a code base. You can see how when I'm working in an editor, these two things are right next to each other, and it makes a lot of uh, semantic sense for working on for working on a project. Taking a quick look back, thanks. Cool. So we have our component here, and uh, we're going to call our component here. So components have to have a dash in the name, and this is something that's, again, based on standards. There's a standard called web components, which are very similar to Ember components, and uh, web components require a dash in the name. So <clears throat> Ember, to make sure that it can align with that in the future, chose to follow the same pattern. So we want to pass this letter in. So just like to an HTML element, if we were to specify an attribute, we specify an attribute by saying letter equals letter. And now inside of my template for this thing, I can just go ahead and access that information that was passed in as an attribute. So here we said that the letter on hangman letter will equal the one that we're going to be walking through in this each. And I can get rid of index. And then in the template for component itself, I can just reference that information. And when we load up the page, we can see the layout changed a little bit. And that's just because each of these has a div around him now because they're a component. And we can change that behavior, but for now I'm going to go ahead and let it let it ride. But we can see that now there's a whole bunch of divs. If I look at the Ember uh, uh, view tree over here, there's a checkbox for components, and we can see that there's all the components that are on the page. So if I want to take a look at any of these, I can I can pull them up and put them in the console and start working with them. Um, so let's go ahead and update our assertions, update our test to say that we see 20. We see well maybe not all 26 letters, but that we see a letter on the page. So let's say that I visit slash and see letter A. So I want to find a, a thing. Now this is going to be kind of a very vague assertion if I just say that it can find something that contains A, right? So let's go ahead and wrap each of these guys in a div, or maybe even better yet, in a span. I'm going to say the class of this is a um, hangman dash letter. And now when we get down here, we can say that I want to find something that is a hangman dash letter that contains A. And uh, I just want to find that one exists. So I say here that the A letter is on the page. Get rid of that other assertion. And now if we go back to our tests, we should see that visiting slash and seeing the letter A is true. So again, this test here is really simple, right? We're just using find to look at the DOM and see what's going on in the DOM. Um, our visit command makes sure that we're makes sure that we're on the correct page. Um, in both the previous test and in this one, you can see how after visiting, we wrap things in a function called and then. So what the and then is doing is managing a bunch of possibly asynchronous actions for us. So you can imagine when I visit this page, maybe in our case it's a very simple page, but in a more complex application, you might need to go to a server and fetch um, you know, data. Uh, you might need to uh, do a variety of things that were asynchronous. To let us write tests where we don't need to think about that behavior, Ember uh, has async helpers uh, and sync helpers. So visit is an example of an async helper, and and then is an example of an async helper. This means that and then will wait until all the previous async helpers were done. So if it, say there is also a button on this page, and we said click like link to another page, 
that link to another page might also have some async in it. So first we would visit, then Ember would wait until all the async was completed, all the server requests, then it would click, then it would wait until all the server requests and all the async were finished, then it would run the contents of my and then function. And we're gonna use a little, a few more of the async helpers uh, pretty, pretty shortly here. Uh, so we have this guy, so let's take a look at Litter CP. All right, so let's add a little bit of a uh, style to this guy. So to add a little bit of style, we're going to go back over to our Ember. Uh, we're going to go back over to our Ember CLI console here. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and install an add-on. If you use Ember install, it's basically going to take care of whatever the package management system is. So there's a package management system underneath Ember here called NPM. Uh, Ember install kind of abstracts that away and lets you just think about, I just want to install this Ember add-on. You don't need to worry about how we're doing it um, underneath. Although if you want to use NPM, you can use NPM directly as well. So I'm going to install a tool called Bourbon, which is um, a library that I like to use for styling. Actually, first, I guess I better install Ember CLI SAS and Ember CLI Bourbon. And you see we're going to go ahead and boot up to NPM, and it's going to pull down a bunch of packages. And I'm going to go ahead and make the um, make some of our style changes while we're, while we're waiting for this guy to work here. So by default, we have an app CSS file. In the app CSS file, obviously, by default, we don't want to presume that we're going to be doing um, you know, SCSS or any other kind of styling. So it's just a CSS file by default. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move it to be an SCSS file, which is the kind of the SAS syntax. And then say I want to import Bourbon, which is going to be the, um, the tools that I love to use. And then we're also going to import um, a Neat I'm going to install. So that's going to be in Bower Components Neat App Style Sheets App Assets. And we're going to see this in just a moment. Slash Neat. Uh, and then I would do a little bit of styling. So for instance, we may have a section and I want to include the outer container to make sure that that renders correctly. And then uh, we're going to have a header. And the header would and some columns. We'll have a row. And these are all things that are just built into Bourbon that make it really easy to lay out, um, like a, a graph layout on the page. Uh, what do I want to do here? Uh, I guess we don't really have our hangman gets his yet, so we'll give him a break, but we will go ahead and say our hangman dash letters is going to be going to be a, a three column, a three column wide thing. Uh, let me go ahead and take a look back at our npm install. And our npm install looks like it worked. Got all of our stuff in there. Seems pretty good. So I'm also going to Bower install and uh, save Neat, because that was the other thing that we have. And so Neat is an example of something that doesn't actually have an, uh, uh, doesn't have an Ember CLI add-on. But that's going to be just fine. There's no reason that we can't use it, even though it doesn't um, have an add-on itself. So this should be enough to get my, uh, my server going. But now that we've installed new dependencies uh, and specifically you know, made some changes to like our, our package JSON and such, I'm going to need to restart my server. My server is not going to be able to just um, reboot all of its dependencies on the fly like that. So we're going to restart the server, and that should be pretty much it. It should come right up. Oops, sorry. Uh... So if I load this up, it says can't find my file. Can't find my file bourbon. And I expect that it could. If I look at my package JSON, Ember CLI. Oh, it looks like Ember CLI bourbon was not actually installed, although Ember CLI SAS was. So I think I've just made a miscalculation in presuming that I could list two things on the console here. So we're going to go and just, uh, we have SAS in there. We're going to kick in Ember CLI bourbon. And we're going to need to reboot the server again for that guy. 
Right. So I already moved my file to the app.css, so it's asking, you know, do I want to overwrite it? And I can say, oh, let me see the change. And it looks like it's going to overwrite it with nothing at all, so I'm going to disregard that change. And boot up our server. Um, so the uh, the next little snafu that I'm getting here is that this um, me app style sheets. It looked like I put app style sheets in here too many times. And if we look at the Bower components directory, you can see Bower components is down here, and we should have our neat folder which has app style sheets, app assets style sheets, and neat. There we go. All of our tests run. And we can see our page runs, and it did some, you know, some kind of crazy formatting. That's okay because we haven't updated our HTML yet. So let's take a look back at our application HBS and make some changes. We said we have a section which is going to be an outer container. So let's wrap this whole thing inside of our section. We said we have a header which is going to go across the entire page. So here's our header to go across the page, and we said we're going to have some rows. So let's go ahead and make this a div and call it a row. Cool. Uh, so this guy, we have one more one which is in here, the, uh, the hangman letter. Hangman letter, we probably want to make this hangman letters is what we actually want to do. And so let's wrap that around our set of letters. And there we go. So there's our list of hangman letters. And let's make a new another box that goes next to it. And let's call this one. Uh, let's call this one the hangman graphic. And let's also go ahead and throw another row above this. And we'll get to what this one's going to be in a moment. And we're going to call this one the hangman guesses. And hangman letters has three. Hangman graphic is going to be the rest. This is a 12 column system, so I can go ahead and say this is going to be nine. And then hangman guesses is going to be 12 columns across. Cool. And if I look at the page, I should have all those guys in there. So, um, so there's our style, and we've got things generally laid out. I'm going to go ahead and make like a, just a, a checkpoint commit here. Cool. So now we have a bunch of uh, buttons, but we can't actually play. We can't actually play our game. We kind of need like a, a game engine that allows us to to do the logic of Hangman here. And uh, I have already written in. I actually wrote an add-on that did this already. And if you guys want to look at the add-on itself, you should be able to find it at Mixonic slash uh, Hangman dash Engine. So this URL here. I'll drop this into drop this into chat. So this is a really simple Ember CLI add-on that just allows us to um, really just have the logic that's in this service right here. So remember I said services can cut across the components in our application. So this is an example of a service that's going to boot up and allow us to call things like play letter and play word and then just have it emit events that are uh, appropriate for different situations. So for example, did lose the game, did win the game, uh, and like a variety of other flags that it has as, as state. So to install that, all I need to do is do an ember install. And uh, the, the file is named ember hangman package. So ember hangman, uh, ember hangman package, sorry, ember hangman engine. So we go ahead and install ember hangman engine. And we go ahead and do my server because I installed the new add on. And that guy should now be installed and ready. So that's installed and ready. To go ahead and access the game, though, the game is a service, so I need to use it somewhere. So I'm going to create a new property on my application controller called game, and I'm going to inject a service, and then the service, this service is called game, so again, I can say I want to install the service called game on here. Now I should have access to this game object on my controller. 
So this isn't doing anything right now. We're not rendering it into the screen. But if I wanted to see what this actually looks like, I can come here to this application in my Ember Inspector, and I have the controller right here. So if I click on it, it's going to pop him open on the side. Well, he's not going to show him right there. Uh, yeah, you can see here that there's a computer property called game. And if I click dollar sign $E, it sends it into the console. So down here on the console, I have something that's my game down here. So if I wanted, I, for example, we said we could play a letter. So you can see play letter is there, and it's a function that allows us to play letters. So the Ember Inspector is a really great, great way for you to um, get access to a specific part of your application and kind of dive in, dive in deeply. Um, so now that we have our game pulled in, uh, we can go ahead and inspect our game state in the template. So by putting game on the controller, game is now just something that's available up here. Uh, so I can go ahead and say maybe um, uh, maybe above my guesses even. Actually, maybe maybe above my letters. Maybe sorry, I don't know quite where I want to put this. I guess we're going to put it inside of Hangman Guesses. Um, inside of Hangman Guesses, we want to go ahead and put some logic that's going to um, basically like allow us to um, look at what the current state of the game is. And I know I know that game already exposes some things like game is waiting. So if the game is waiting, then I want to say. Um, would you like to play a game of Hangman? And then uh, we're going to want an input that we can go ahead and type in our first word into. So in here, we can put an input, and Ember provides a helper called input that makes this a little bit easier. Name here is just a name that will be good for us to be able to use with testing. And then value is going to have to be a binding. Uh, so I'm going to bind the property value on the input to the variable new word. So let's go ahead and add that variable on here. So now I have a property on my controller, which is the, the context for this. And that property will change as value changes. And then we're going to want to uh, go ahead and fire an event when someone hits enter on this input. So to do that, we're going to insert new line, and we're going to say um, new word. So to handle this action, um, I need to create an actions hash on top of this uh, controller, or a component can handle actions as well. So here's our action, and it's going to be called play word. This is another piece of ES6 syntax where I don't need to type out colon into the function name. If you're just going to name a function, you can just declare it like a function like this. So we're going to have a word, and the word we said was bound to be um, new, uh, new word. So I'm going to go ahead and pull off the word here, and then I want to tell the game that we're going to play the word. So this.get, uh, sorry, for the game. And I want to play a word, and I want to play the word itself. And uh, then after that, of course, you know, we don't want to keep having that word all, the, all uh, hanging around in the input. So we're going to go ahead and say that the new word is going to turn into be black. And then if we're actually playing the game, we would want this to show something different. We wouldn't want to show the input anymore. So we can say, else if the game is playing. So if we're currently in the middle of playing the game, then we can go ahead and show a message that says like, oh buddy, bet you cannot guess this one. So let's take a look back at our back at our test here. So we have one test that says that we see the letter A. Let's add a new test that says that we uh, enter a word. So first we need to visit the slash page, and then once we get on the slash page, we're going to fill in an input that has a name. So I'm going to fill in an input that has a name called word. And what I want to fill it in with is going to be oh, whatever word I want to play, which in this case is just going to be Bob. And then if I want to uh, uh, test that I actually was able to uh, hit hit enter on this, on this um, input and that it did something, I'm going to need to say that there is a key event and again, it's on the same word. And I uh, will say it was key up, and I pressed key 13. And key 13 is like a event event slang for enter. That's what that's what enter is when you hit enter on a key. So I can go ahead and show that like 
when we get into this state, we expect that I would find on the page um, some text that looks like we're going to be um, playing the game. So uh, I expect to find the words like, guess this one. So when I reload the app, we can see that I have my thing. It says, do I want to play Hangman? When I look at my test, it doesn't actually look like my test passed here. But I can say Bob, and I can hit Enter, and I get, you cannot guess this one. So what is, what is the... So to figure out what's, what's happening on, on this test... Oh, well, I see what's happening already. These three things are all async test helpers, so they're all safe. They all manage um, the asynchronous possible side effects that might happen if you were to any of these were to trigger some kind of Ajax or something like that. However, this assertion, assertions themselves, cannot be um, async safe. So this last one we need to wrap inside an and then to make sure it runs at the right time. Now we can see that goes ahead and it asserts that we actually see our new text when we see this. Um, these tests also run, like they're running on the page. So if you do something like drop a debugger in, if we run just this one test, oh, sorry, that's just the JS hint test. If we run just this uh, enter a word test here, and I open up the dev tools, you can see when I hit the debugger that I've added, I can see the real application running. So this is a great way for you to, uh, if you're running into a test and you're not quite sure what's happening, this is a great spot to look and try to figure out, oh, what's actually happening in, this, um, in, in the code at this particular point in time. Um, cool. So let's go ahead and get some letters hooked up right, right, right quick here, since I know that we're going to be running out of time uh, really shortly, unfortunately. Um, So whenever we click on one of our one of these guys, we want to know that we've guessed a letter, right? So if we do something right now, they don't actually do anything. So we kind of need to hook up click events for each of these letters. So uh, in order to hook up the click events, uh, I just need to be able to call uh, play letter on the game. So we're going to say I'm going to define a hook called click. And when we click, uh, right now actually we're just going to go ahead and play that letter all the time. So this. I get game, and again, if I want access to this game service, I need to pull it in. So game is ember.inject.service. And um, the, the name game is implied if you don't um, actually specify it. So we'll go on to play the letter, this.get. And again, we have our letter for this component was passed to us in this template here. Our letter was passed as letter. So inside of the component, we can also ask, access this docket letter and have access to it. So this will go ahead and, and play the actual letter. So let's say we take a look at guessing Bob. It says I can't guess Bob. Well, I click B and I click O. We can see that the text went away. So I've played both of those, and now the game has entered some new state. So we should take a look at what that state is. So we can actually show that in the um, show that in the UI. So we have else if game is playing, we want to know if uh, we're currently in a winning state. Or we want to know if we're in a losing state. And now we can go ahead and couple to our to our winning and losing state. So this should be enough that we can go back again to our test. We can go ahead and insert assert that when we're playing a given word, we can win the game. So we enter word Bob. We go ahead and have key up. We want to go ahead and click on one of these things. So before we asserted that we could find these elements on the page by looking at hangman letter. So now we want to make sure that we can click them. So I'm going to go ahead and click something that contains the letter A, hangman letter that contains A, or I guess in this case we want to click B, and then we want to click one that contains O, and those should be the only two letters that we need for Bob. And then we want to go ahead and look and see O man you won, so we'll go ahead and assert that we say you won.
So we go and see our tests. There's all our tests, and that totally works. So we can show a winning message. And we want to see that we actually see a failing message as well. So to see our losing message, we need to hit a bunch of other letters, right? So let's do like R, S, uh, T, U, V, W, X, Y. So to show losing message, we still say it says you won. And what we, we want to see again is try again. And sure enough, if we come over here and we go ahead and we play a game for Bob, and we can hit a whole bunch of different letters. And oh, we must have hit, I had just hit O in there, so I won. So we have like winning and losing states now. So that's that's uh, that's like a good another good checkpoint where we know we're actually exercising our game. Uh, and now we could take a look at actually uh, at reflecting that change. Let's go ahead and show uh, a quick little like guess thing that, that actually shows what the um, uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and show like a guess that shows what letters have actually been played. So in order to do this, we want to show like a list of um, say if you have Bob, you want to see three blank spaces, right? So you can see what words have actually been chosen in the game. So let's go into our template. I always like to drive these things from the template level. So down here we did each of our letters. Now we're going to do something a little bit different. We're actually going to look for each of our, um, our word letters. We only want the letters in the word. And for each one of those, we don't want to do a hangman letter, but we're going to do like the fact that this is a hangman guess. So we're going to call it the hangman guess. And this means I need to create a new component for this. Hangman guess. Needs to be a component for hangman guests. If I reload this guy, we can see now I have a hangman guest up here. And he has component, he has word. So he is also going to do something uh, kind of similar. He needs to say, if I have been guessed, then I want to show my letter. But if I haven't yet been guessed, oops. Uh, then I would just want to show like an underscore, right? I don't want to actually show anything at all about what I really what I really contain. So in order to do this, we this component logic again can just go ahead and reference the game it can use to show this. Um, I guess before we do that, though, we should see. Let's go ahead and say that is guessed is just true. So they should now just show all of our words. If we go back to our application template, we're walking through each of word letters. So we're going to need to define word letters so that they're actually there. So our word letters are going to be pretty simple. Whenever we play a new word, we want to set um, we want to set a new thing called word called word letters. So when we play this game, let's say this dot set word letters. And again, all we need to do is take our word and split it into an array of things. That should give us all of our word letters on the page. So whenever I say Bob, we now see B, O, and B. So by default, all these components, they are, um, they're always divs, which is why you see them going um, vertical here. We can use a, a property called tag name to change that to be something else. So here, I can go ahead and say my tag name is actually going to be a span. And now, when I run those, we'll see that they go in a row, which is more akin to what we're actually going to want to do here. So now we want to set is guest, right? So our hangman game emits a couple of our hangman game emits a couple of actions um, events that we can go ahead and subscribe to. So on init, let's go ahead and subscribe to these events so we can set up things. So whenever we call init or any function that we're going to override, that's like part of Ember or any you know other library that you pull in, you pretty much always want to find a way to call super. And this is again something that's going to be really popular and um, or you will need to often do in JavaScript classes, which are a real thing in ES6 and will be um, more widespread in the future. And we're going to want to pull off the game. 
So get game. And that means that this component also is going to need access to the game. So we'll say the game is an ember.inject.service. Whoops, comma. Get rid of our is guest true. Well, actually, I guess say is guest is false by default. So our game emits an, act, uh, an event called, um, well, first one is did reset is the first one that we need to think about. So whenever we reset the game, we're going to want to call a reset on ourselves. So let's make a reset function so that when someone changes the word, we actually go ahead and reset our own state. So this dot set is guessed. If we have a new word, you know, we won't actually be guessable. It'll be false. The second one that we need to react to is when you have a, uh, a new letter guessed, right? Did guess letter. And when we did guess a letter, we're going to get in the letter. So I'm just going to call it L here as a little slang. And I'm going to use a, a shorthand function, which is another ES6 thing. And if my letter is the same as the letter that I have for this component, then set my is guessed to be true. And this should go ahead and toggle our thing into true as soon as someone guesses the letter, which is our letter. Remember, this could happen for multiple things. So if my word is Bob, the first one is B, the last one is B. So they're both going to need to check. And they're both going to get that event, and they're both going to look and say, oh, is it me? And they're each going to update. If I say, oh, oh, we'll go ahead and do the same thing. Uh, so now we have a really slick way to go ahead and show that progress. Let's go ahead and add that. Super rad. And I think the last thing that we can uh, that we can do here, uh, do we have the time to do one more one more really quick thing, Mark? Uh, yeah, sure. One more quick thing, and then maybe we can hit a couple questions before we wrap up. That sounds totally great. So cool. this last one we'll keep, we'll keep really quick. So again, we're doing this um, we're doing this very uh, event driven from this service called Game. So we want to pull in an actual graphic that looks like something, right? So I have uh, already. Let's go ahead and first make our graphics. So we're going to make a new component called hangman-graphic. And for Riva, this we'll see I have my hangman graphic. I'm going to take this template and I'm actually going to read in a file that I have sitting around already that has a um, that, that has like a hangman graphic already in it. I think it's called hangman graphic. And this is just pulled off of like Wikimedia, Wiki, uh, Wiki, Wiki Foundation. And I've got a bunch of different markers in here for what the different parts of the body are in this SVG. But as it is right now, if I just put Hangman Graphic on the page, it should render. So let's go back to our application template here, and let's find the spot where we're going to go and put our component. Here's our Hangman Graphic div. So let's call this Hangman Graphic here. And now when we load up the page, we see like our, our Hangman. But of course, we want him to actually react to things. We don't want him to just be a static hangman. So we can go and uh, let's go and update his template first. So his template, we know we're going to have like a, basically a bunch of state information, right? When his body is going to be uh, when his body is going to be selected, we know that we're going to be showing his body. So we can say like if is showing. Body, then we want to show this one. And if we are showing the head, then we can do this one. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are, and the, the whole pattern of like is showing um, is kind of a, a pattern uh, that you'll often see in Ember applications. I, I guess you would just say it's an idiom that we have for development that you try to um, mark Boolean things as an is or as a, as a has. So that it's easy for other people to know um, what, what you're doing. Left leg. And then we only have these two left. Is showing left arm. And right arm showing right arm. 
Oh, OK, great. So there's a whole bunch of our state information. But again, this is now it's just going to show false, right? Because our component doesn't have any of that state. When we defined it here and we called it, when we called our graphic, we didn't pass it any of those properties. And when we look at the component JS, it doesn't have any of those properties itself. So we're going to need to um, make those properties for the graphic uh, be present and update. So kind of like the way that I like to do this is to say that we're going to have, because um, this is a little bit of like an ugly thing to do, right? We have lots of these properties over and over again, and we certainly don't want to keep typing them. So I'm going to go ahead and make us a quick helper. So we're going to say we're not showing the head. We're going to do the body and left arm and uh, right arm and uh, left leg and right leg. None of these things are showing. This component, of course, is going to also be access to the game. Um, it's going to need access to the game, and then it's going to need to, uh, again, react to a bunch of events, right? So let's say in it, and this dot underscore super, because we want to make sure that we call our parents. And then when we load up, we're going to go ahead and let's call our reset immediately to make sure that we have things in a good place. Write a reset function. And what we'll do is we'll just set the properties to match this reset properties every, every single time. And set properties is like a bulk way for us to set a lot of properties at once. And we need to keep track of how many uh, letters we've missed every single time, right? So if we get a new word, we want our missed letter count to go back to being zero. Uh, so let's go ahead and now do our find our game. And let's attach the missed. We want to attach that same, like, um, before we attach the event whenever you guessed a letter, and now we're going to attach the event when you miss a letter. So whenever we miss a letter, we don't really care about what the letter is, so I'm not going to take it as an argument. We just know that we need to increment this property. Uh, right, so this will make sure that our missed letter count goes up, um, goes up every single time. Sorry, a little typo here. So this will make sure our missed letter count goes up every time. And now we need an actual way to like show this information, right? We're not we're not updating the any of these properties every time we increment this, and so we need a little bit of a map. So let's add a uh, function called update graphic. And the nice thing about what we're going to do with update graphic here is that it's, it's item potent. We can call it as many times as we want, wherever we want to, and we don't need to really worry about like making sure that we have the right arguments to it or that we keep track. Instead, it should just look at the missed letter count and decide what to do on its own, uh, and that'll be like really helpful to us because it'll be a lot simpler to implement. So we'll go ahead and we want a switch statement, and let's build our switch statement on this dot get missed letter count. So every time we have an, every time we call this function, we're going to look at missed letter count, and we're going to go ahead and do something. If it's the case where it's going to be one, then all we need to worry about is setting is showing a head to being true. And with case statements in JavaScript, you always need to break. If it's going to be two, then it would be the body that we want to show up. It's going to be three. That's going to be the left arm. And it's going to be two done fewer body parts. Uh, left leg. And lastly, the right leg. Cool. So let's take a look at our guy. He's blank by default. We go ahead and we start off our word Bob. And we click C. And we get the event that goes down to our human graphic component. 
And remember how we said we can use the Ember console, uh, the Ember inspector over here to find these different things. Here's our hangman graphic at the bottom. And so if I click on our, if we click on the viewer component here for the hangman graphic, he pops out from the side. We can see here's all the states. So his head is true, his body is false. If I click on one more of these things, we can see it change to say that his body is showing true. So this is a great example of how like the, the inspector lets us really get deep into what's happening with the middle of this SVG graphic where we just put a bunch of different settings. And of course, if we you know fly through these and then we get to our our B and OB, we still get Oman U1, but like anyone who loves to play Hangman, we can still click on all the letters until we actually get the guy to hang. So I think that's our really blazingly quick run through of how to build a Hangman application with um, with Ember.js. So uh, please, if you guys have any questions um, or anything like that, go ahead and uh, fire away. I'll try and get uh, these links together for you guys so you can check them out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was that was awesome and, and the most gamified uh, office hours that we've had. <laughs> um, so some questions coming in. We can hit a, we can hit a few. Um, can I write my Ember handlebars code in Python or Ruby instead of JavaScript? So the um, by handlebars code, I presume you mean um, uh, templates. And I know maybe this person can't actually um, respond to any of these things that I'm saying out loud. But I presume you mean these these handlebars templates here. And the answer is no. So one of the things that's um, great about these templates, from the perspective of, of Ember, uh, at least, is that they have very little, or they have a very strict form of logic in them. So uh, in a lot of ways, they're very similar to a list. So we have a series of elements. And at compile time, Ember can know that these are static things. And then we have a series of dynamic things, like we have an each loop, and we have a couple data bindings. Ember, again, can know that these are dynamic parts of the page. And this is what's going to allow it to um, have like a lickety split fast um, rendering engine. If we were to allow arbitrary logic to be inside of these templates, um, they would not compile as quickly. And they also wouldn't render as quickly when you're trying to use them on the client side. Gotcha. Um, so a lot of people, actually, some people emailed in this question, and then also throughout this, we're asking. Just you know, it, it's almost impossible not to also think about the other popular JavaScript options like React and Backbone, and um, you know, where do you see? How do you see Ember comparing to those? And, and in terms of you know, if you're in the situation of making a decision of what to use on a project, you know, what are the variables you're looking at that might lead you towards Ember? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, so where Ember really excels is when you want to build um, a true application experience. So this is another, um, um, I guess I'm just going to start dropping some things into the comments here. But um, this is a web page that um, gets together a list of like different Ember applications. And I think if you were to look at these and compare them to applications that you might see someone using React with, or mm, Angular doesn't have a lot of public caps. So I'm not quite sure which one I would point it at. But if you compare this with other people, I think you'll see things like um, the Heroku dashboard. Uh, or my friends have a company called Aptable and their dashboard. Um, like more complicated, in-depth um, like app application things and not really publicly consumable websites. Um, and you can see on Built with Embryo how a lot of these are like, you know, the very few of them are like this one that we're looking at right now, um, where it's just a spark plug website. And many of them are more complicated things like a chat tool. So I really think that's where it excels. There are some exceptions to this. Um, one notable one is the website bustle.com, uh, which is a truly just like a, a, a news website, uh, but is a great, also a great Ember application that works really well on mobile and a variety of platforms. Sorry, I was muted. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think. That helps, and um, I'll. For, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, but I'll. Uh, I'll send an email out to everybody who's RSVP'd for this session um, with uh, with a lot of the links that Matthew is providing, so um, you don't have to worry about you know copying these down right now. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I, I mean, lastly, uh, other than some of these links, you know, what other are there any big resources? Are there any books or or blogs that you've been following that have been really helpful to you while you've been learning Ember? Uh, uh, there are, so there's, um, there's really two really great resources. One is Ember Weekly. Ember Weekly is a newsletter um, that is very low traffic. Once a week, it's, it's very like, um, it doesn't get in your face or annoy you or anything like that. Um, but it's a great way to try and uh, uh, to start like perusing the, the community and seeing what's happening. Another really good one is um, 
uh, Ember Watch. Ember Watch is another great like uh, thing that you can see. There's a lot of video tutorials. He links to a lot of blog posts. Well, it looks like the talks are actually kind of out of date, but he does have a um, a Twitter account, which is a very good Twitter account to follow. I think those are good starting points. Um, one other uh, book that I might recommend is 101 by Adolfo Boulds. He does a lot of work on the command line tool that we just looked at, and uh, his book comes with updates for a really long time after you purchase it and looks like it's a pretty great um, tool. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, we'll definitely check a lot of that stuff out. Um, Matthew, thank you so much for your time um, and, and for everybody who's joined. I definitely recommend checking out the Code Mentor YouTube channel to rewatch a lot of what Matthew walked through. That'll be up as soon as we end this, uh, this broadcast. Uh, this is definitely the kind of thing it's worth reviewing a few times. Um, and uh, yeah, if, there, if there's nothing else, I think I'll, I'll say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And thanks so much. And uh, we'll uh, we'll be in, in touch with, with more uh, via office hours. Thanks so much, Matthew. Great. Thanks for attending, everyone. Cheers. Yeah.